We need to be really strong about it. I think we need to word it a bit stronger, if that makes sense. Because I think, please think twice before attending our emergency department. I think, please do not attend our emergency department unless it is... A genuine emergency. A genuine emergency. I really do think we need to make the message really clear. At Nottingham University Hospitals Trust, following a surge in the number of patients over Christmas and New Year, every one of their 1,700 beds is occupied. Overnight, we had a huge influx of admissions, so that means that we have started the day with 30 people needing beds. We've used all of our bed stock, so this is now uncharted territory for us. As a designated major trauma centre, the hospital doesn't close its doors. New patients who need to be admitted are being lined up in an open area in the middle of A&E while they wait for space to become available on the wards. We've got people waiting for beds that have been here all night and we've still got new patients coming in. There is no stop button. Where there's space, there will be a trolley. It makes me feel anxious that I'm just in the middle of a room with loads of people that I don't know. It's not very dignified people spending the nights. Hours and hours on trolleys next to random strangers when they're poorly. I started working here in 2005 and the, the change has been um, night and day. 10, 15 years ago, we used to play cricket in the middle because there was no patients. Staff were just waiting, to, waiting for jobs and now you know, you're log jammed quite literally. Hi, uh, that's you, not ready, but I'm, I, I want to try and just take yeah. two people out of here in? because it looks like a ward. You can't move in blue for trolleys. Thank you, bye-bye. We just need to clear you out. Uh, any, any movement out of here now is a bonus. Gosh, it looks like a ward next door. For all those who haven't been here over the weekend, we've seen unrelenting demand, I think it's fair to say, through ED for mainly respiratory and uh, frail elderly patients. Whilst we've had outlying capacity up until this point, today we have run out of space. So we've got all our escalation beds full and we've got more than 20 patients waiting for beds at 6 o'clock first thing this morning. So today we declared black. Black is the hospital's highest state of alert. It's triggered when the hospital is full and there are more than 20 people waiting in A&E to be admitted. Anyone that's been here over three hours go into this red colour. And in theory, we shouldn't have anyone over this four hour mark. But as you can see, there's someone been here nearly 15. According to government guidelines, patients attending A&D should be seen, treated and either admitted or discharged within four hours. Hello again. We met last night yeah, we did, um, yes. at the end of my shift <laughs> and you're still here at the beginning. I'm still here. I don't know what's going on now. So what they think it, you've got is a condition called pseudomembranous colitis, right. which is a very long way of saying basically that you've got an inflamed colon. You are one of the longest waiters because you're waiting for a side room because of the risk of it being infected. 13 hours, 14 hours now or something? Quarter to three, I think, I came in. It's crazy. Uh, Absolutely crazy. Yeah. Any questions for me? No, not really. Just go and kick somebody out of bed. Yeah. <laughs> Literally. Please. One in, one out. <laughs> the system's broken, but it's not A&E that can fix it. The real pressure is discharge. So the problem that we've got here is that there's a dam further downstream, and as a result, we're filling up. With every bed in the trust occupied, the only way a new patient can be admitted is if another one leaves. The Trust's ability to clear A&D now depends on how many patients can be discharged. We've got a queue every single, every single way in now. Um, and a queue to get out into the community. In site operations, the hospital's central computer system gives real-time updates about the location of any bed that might become free. It, it shows where all our, of our capacity, or, or where our capacity isn't. <laughs> Hello, Debelina speaking. Bed flow coordinator Debelina must follow up on any possible discharges. We need to go to 51, 54, B3, 
discharge large. <laughs> but we basically need to go everywhere. It's her job to make sure as many patients as possible are discharged through what is referred to as the back door. Have you got anybody that's likely to be able to step down? This patient is still going to Blenheim. They're still this going. This lady can go to Sheffield. However, there isn't a bed, but we're ringing them daily. OK. Whereabouts in Sheffield is she going? M2 at the Hallam Show. M2, but there isn't a bed. No. OK. Morning. Who's in charge today? Um, Amy discharges today. I've got a few. I'm still middle of handover. I'll okay. let you know. So, as of yet, there's not many discharges that the wards are confirming. So, we haven't created any beds yet. Most patients can leave hospital as soon as they're well enough, but a significant number require ongoing care, making them more difficult to discharge. Mandy, a roundup, if you don't mind. We now have 95 that are medically fit for discharge. There are 95 people who are fit to go home. Yes. Yep. Yeah. If you didn't work in a hospital setting, you would be surprised how many people are medically fit. Probably four or five whole wards that you could fill full of patients who don't need to be in an acute hospital. It's shocking. Mavis, how long have you been in here? Yes. Not quite years. A few months. A few months. A lot of people think it's the front door where all the problems are in NHS, but it's actually the back door, and trying to get people out the back door is, is just as difficult. So there's a medical note. Thank you very much. Do you want me to introduce you to her? Yes, please, yeah. Thank you. Can I just introduce you to Richard? Richard just come to talk to you. Yeah. Hello, Richard. Hi, Mavis. My name's Richard. 86-year-old Mavis has dementia. She's been well enough to leave hospital for over a month, but her discharge has been delayed by a shortage of suitable beds in local care homes. I've got a few questions I'm going to ask you, and I'm going to be writing some things down, if that's all right. Today, Mavis is being assessed by Beechdale Care Home to see whether they can accommodate her needs. Are you from the area? Do you know the area, Nottingham? I live in there. Uh, yeah? I live on Queen's Medical Centre. You've got a lovely eyes. You're a sexy man. <laughs> <laughs> Mavis does not need this acute bed, and there's people in the emergency department now that do need this acute bed. It just puts a, a massive strain on everybody. Do you want to feed you, or do you want me to feed you? Yeah. Watch my... Is that nice? Is that nice? No, I don't like it. What do you mean you don't like it? Ooh. <laughs> We never ever thought that we'd put her in at home, no matter mm. how bad she got. You, something you would never do. And we used to go at night, didn't we? Yeah. I used to go every night for quite a few years now. What do you mean you don't like it? I don't like it. Are you having a bit more? No. Why? Would you rather you were looking after her? Yeah. We, we said this had never happened, but it's had to happen. She started to have falls last time. She went to the fridge in the night and fell back, didn't she? And by the time we got there, there was glass everywhere, but she got the tiniest little nick, didn't she, on yeah, her head? And yet she was surrounded by glass. It's terrible. You know that it's unmanageable. Yeah, isn't you it? can't cope, yeah. Yeah. I'll wait a bit then. Mavis will remain in hospital until a suitable bed becomes available in a care home. We want something local, cos, as you can see, she's got family and people don't want to travel too far. We've got to see the places, haven't we, and see if that they're all right. As well as caring for patients already in hospital and admitting new ones through A&E, beds must also be found for patients booked for planned operations. Twelve-year-old Keelan has been diagnosed with a severe form of scoliosis, a condition that means his spine is becoming increasingly curved. We'd got back from holiday. He came into the living room. He'd had quite a gro growth spurt. He, he like, come down to say, oh, look at my muscles, you know, I've, I've like, got really big. Um, <laughs> and he was kind of twisted on his hip, ever so slightly. Um, 
And we rushed to the Leicester Royal Infirmary where they checked him out, done some x-rays, some scans, and it found the, the scoliosis curve. In two years, his, his curve is like 100% increased. It's caused his lung to not function correctly, so his breathing's down at 50% for a child of his age. I'll have a little listen in. Oh. I don't think it's too cold. You can check it. It's all right. Keelan's condition is rapidly deteriorating. He's come to Queen's Medical Centre for a final examination before an operation to straighten his spine in two weeks' time. Can you just take some nice deep breaths for me? Keelan's operation will be performed by leading spinal surgeon Mike Grevitt. It's not difficult to see that, you know, there is this significant curvature there. It's really curved and it's one of the more challenging curves that we'll be doing this year. You can see that where the spine bends in, this is the amount of lung he has on this side compared to that side. You can see how crowded his ribs are, which is what gives him the breathing problems that he has. He's got a big hump on his back, and, and, and that in a, in a very slim lad is very noticeable, and children at times can be quite cruel, so that hump on his back will be significantly better. Keelan's spine will be straightened by screwing metal rods into his vertebrae. Our main job is to keep you safe, and what we want to do is keep you and all the bits of you as safe and healthy as possible. OK, have you got any questions? When you come out of the operation, yeah, and, like, you feel like you're, like, you're really, 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 really in pain, like, yes. what will happen? So, when you're first waking up, we start to give you some painkillers so that you're going to feel comfortable when you wake up. We will definitely help you with it, yeah? We'll always be trying to get you as comfortable as possible. Keelan's 12 years old, so he, he's... He's got a level of understanding what's going to happen to him. To be honest, he's not dealing with it very well. He's not sleeping at all very well. And he's obviously all over the place. It's impacting him. I understand, yeah. The operation can only go ahead if there is a bed in paediatric intensive care where Keelan can recover. A shortage of these beds has led to the operation being cancelled before. As time goes on, he's, you know, his, his curve has gone from 35 to 80 degrees in less than two years. It's got to be done. Do you, do you get what I mean? Where I you, do you, and you, understand, you, you yeah. You meet that road and it's got to happen. Well, I think, I think we're totally with you yeah. on that. So it's just been unfortunate because of no intensive yeah. care bed. I think you'd be really unlucky if we hit another bump. So what do we do if we hit that bump? Um, we know that you've come this far and it's not been an easy journey. And so I'm sure to the best of our ability, they're going to pull out all the stops for you, Keelan, to get you get you your surgery. And I'm sure that Mr. Grevitt is working with the managers and intensive care to do everything he can to make sure that things go ahead. Okay. Yeah. So let, let's keep op optimistic for that and do everything we can to make that happen. But but we still won't start in theatre until we know that we've got that intensive care bed. The, the cancellation. I find, I find it very frustrating. You're just living in kind of a, a no man's land and you don't know where you're going or what you're doing or, you know, even, even now, you know, we could be cancelled, you know, it's, it's just really frustrating. On an average day, Queen's A&D treats 550 patients. Today, they've seen over 700. So, you know, at one point today, we've had a patient arriving into the department every, every two minutes. That's a massive strain on our resources. An increase in flu and respiratory diseases means more patients than usual need to be admitted. Fuck off! Fuck off! Just, sweetheart, there's some really poorly people Shut next up. door. No, no, nothing in the baby! This lady, she needs some psychiatric input. Yeah, yeah, we are yeah. Going yeah. Well, we, 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 haven't, we haven't got a choice now. We're taking up valuable resource, police time, your time, our time. She's disrupting sick patients. My leg bone where it joins my knee 
has been broken and they say they're going to operate on me tomorrow. I said, oh, does that mean I've got to stay overnight if you're going to operate? Oh, right, and they said, to, yes, got, it does. The newspaper and the crossword probably you'll be on C5, yeah, could, but we'll let you know when we've got the space. So All here right. I sit. Right, so folks, we are, are black. We will we'll remain on black. We'll assess it at nine o'clock tomorrow morning. Um, given the poor bed forecast, please can you escalate any delays that is going to affect every single discharge. We're so dependent now on, on, on any, any single bed that's coming up to make our area safe and to not give patients unnecessarily long waits. Can you tell me what level of pain you're in? It's agony. Absolutely agony. <laughs> and I can't shift my weight without it absolutely ripping through my knee. How do you feel when you see this? Yes. So, um, um, defeated, to be honest. Um, yeah, and I know, we're, I know we're not doing the right thing for patients um, when it's this busy. Tomorrow's going to be really, really horrible. We've had 70 arrivals today and there are 57 patients in the department. So quite a lot of those patients have been in the department since yesterday tea time um, and they are still waiting for a bed. So whilst we've been home and had a sleep in a comfy bed, they are still waiting in A&E. Nottingham is one of dozens of NHS trusts declaring black alert across the country. With so many A&D departments struggling to cope, the NHS makes an unprecedented intervention. OK, right, if everyone's OK, we'll make a start then, please. One of the biggest issues requiring resolution is just some clarity over the statement that came out from <coughs> NHS England. So, Rachel, I think you've had some more information about that. We are being asked to cancel any non-essential activity, so, essentially. So not cancer, not clinically urgent, but pretty much anything else. Every hospital in the country is being advised to cancel non-urgent elective surgery until the end of January. It's a bit of a shock when you first hear it. It is a very blunt tool, but it is one that has been sanctioned. To give people an approximate idea of the numbers, we bring in, at the moment, on average, around 54 patients a day, electively, across both campuses, of which around 32 are cancer or clinically urgent. So that leaves 22 a day that potentially could uh, be cancelled. What's the logic, then, of doing all these cancellations? So the logic is, absolutely, it does free up space and capacity. It deals with the immediate pressure on our emergency department. Cancelling operations means beds that would have been taken by patients having surgery can now be given to those waiting in A&E. We plan to reduce our uh, elective activity, our surgical activity, um, at this time of year anyway. That's a, that's a norm. So it's a normal, it is normal practice for a, a large organisation like this to change the way in which it works to deal with the pressure it's presented with. Was cancelling all um, non-emergency and non-cancer electives part of the normal plan? No. Four miles across town at the Trust's other hospital, Nottingham City, the first operations to be cancelled are from a list of hip and knee replacements. So if we start on stage of 23, we're going to cancel him. Andrew Hall, we're going to cancel him. Some of these patients are already at the hospital awaiting their operations. Afraid I've come with some bad news today. Um, unfortunately, we're going to have to cancel your procedure. We're going to have to cancel your procedure today. Oh dear, that was... And I'm really sorry about that. Yeah. Individuals have waited already a considerable period of time for uh, operations to relieve them of significant pain. We can't do that one. No. I've no bed for him and no potential bed for him. Sometimes I think patients requiring hip and knee replacement are forgotten in the greater scheme of things of the NHS and they're pushed to the bottom of the queue. There's not a clinical priority around this lady, but she's in ready, marked and changed, so yeah. that's difficult. Uh, because it's not considered life-saving, it's not cancer, it's not heart disease, but, uh, but we forget just how much these patients struggle. Right, so we are to cancel on all non-cancer um, elective activity, excluding, of course, emergency work. Deputy Director of Surgery Alex Navarro 
calls together the general managers from every surgical specialty to decide which operations should be cancelled. Right, so our task uh, and your task from here is to compile lists of what activity needs to go ahead and what activity needs to be cancelled. But a big aortic aneurysm will kill you a hell of a lot faster than cancer. So where you come across those kind of things, that would, that would if you have got a, a, an aneurysm at risk of rupture, that would constitute an emergency case. Can I ask where we stand with 52-week breaches? Because we've got a 52-week patient coming in for a GI next <coughs> Tuesday. Will they be able to go ahead or do they need to be cancelled? Are they cancer? No, they're not cancer. Cancel. So they need to be cancelled. How rare is this? This is nearing unprecedented levels of demand. I've never seen anything like it. It's absolutely unprecedented. Staff must now call all patients whose operations have been cancelled. Hello, this is Julie. I'm one of the orthopaedic secretaries at the City Hospital. Hello, you're supposed to be coming in for your operation with Mr James. Yes, I'm very sorry, but I don't know if you've heard uh, the recent news, but we have a bed crisis in the hospital and we're going to have to cancel operations um, at this moment. Hi, it's Lynette at the QMC. Hello, I'm afraid it's bad news. We are going to have to cancel tomorrow. I'm really sorry. I know, and I'm incredibly sorry. At, at the moment, we're... Um, Patients with uh, with cancer and, and clinically urgent patients are getting their surgery, but we... Hello, is that Sarah? Yes, hello, sir. It's Michael Grevitt here from Queen's. I want to phone up to apologise on behalf of the Trust for letting you down on this occasion. You know, not just Queen's, but the NHS in general is under you know, a real strain at the moment. How does it feel to cancel patients? Uh, I think after many years, uh, it's familiar territory, uh, but each occasion uh, doesn't feel any less uncomfortable. And uh, we came into medicine to serve patients and uh, we share their disappointments when we're unable to meet their expectations. It, it def you definitely will get your surgery this year. Um, it's just that. I understand. I really do understand. I'm incredibly sorry. Following the advice from the NHS, more than 22,000 operations are cancelled across the country. At Nottingham City Hospital, consultant orthopaedic surgeon Peter James is one of many surgeons whose workload has been decimated. This is the theatre I usually work in. It is quite strange to come into a theatre on a, on a Thursday morning when it should be my operating list and I should be here working and it's empty. On a routine list here, we would do between five and six hip or knee replacements per day in one theatre. And if you take that then across the other four theatres in the block, the average here will be 105 to 110 cases per week. Uh, I don't know what we're doing at the moment, but it's probably 20 to 30 cases a week. We've never had it as bad as this before. We don't know when we can start operating again at the moment. With no surgery taking place, the only clinical work Peter can do is treat a minor knee complaint. It's just a simple injection for tendonitis. as the sort of case we'd usually do in clinic. It won't take long, two or three minutes at the most. OK, the 5 mil syringe then. It's great, thank you. OK, just let your leg flop to me a bit. This is a tender spot there, yeah? Yeah? OK, just a little scratch on your skin now. This may just be a bit uncomfortable. Most of what we're putting in is local anaesthetic, yeah? So but just a little bit of anti-inflammatory medication as well to try and settle down the inflammation of that tendon. Good. You can go straight home. Yeah. There's a pretty minor thing we've done for you. And uh, we'll see you in the clinic in eight weeks. We'll get that appointment sent out to you, OK? Thank you. Great stuff. By 8.47am, Peter's clinical work for the day is done. We're just left largely at a loose end, feeling that we should be uh, contributing, that we should be 
working, we've been paid to work, uh, but just trying to find something constructive to do. You know, in a hospital like this, we're all so specialised as consultants that we can't make decisions uh, uh, on patients who don't belong to our specialty because we don't have the knowledge, we don't have the expertise. And it's not just me, it's the theatre staff. So we have all the theatre staff who will be underutilised. Anaesthetists are in the same position, that the lists are going down so there, everyone's finishing early. It is just a, a frustrating time for all staff, patients and everyone. Pretty weird. They were completely weird. I guess if it was summer I could go and play golf. But... It's a week since the NHS advised hospitals across the country to cancel non-urgent elective surgery for the whole of January. Chief Operating Officer Caroline Shaw is back from annual leave. Dreadful week last week, wasn't it? I bet you heard all about it. Yeah, every minute of a day. I'm responsible for running the operations at the hospital, fundamentally. Um, looking after 15,000 staff and millions of patients that come through the door. I was a nurse, trained as a nurse and a midwife, um, so practised clinically and loved every minute. When I was a midwife, I was quite anti-management, actually. I used to think they didn't know what they were talking about. For me, I do this job to make a difference for our patients. Last week was horrendous, wasn't it? Oh, my goodness. Have you all survived? Yeah. Are you all OK? Yeah. Cancelling operations has increased the number of beds available for new patients. So it looks quite good, doesn't it, really? Yeah. Allowing the hospital to clear A and D. To actually say no routine elective patients, that really demonstrates the pressure. And how much of a pressure is it for you? Oh, a huge amount. Underlying all of that is the financial position of the trust. The Trust already has a deficit of £26 million. Cancelling operations is costing the hospital even more. We obviously get income for the patients we operate on, um, so we're going to lose that income. So we need to think about that and reflect on that. Right. Are we all right, Ray? The main thing I want to talk through this morning is, is the, um, the elective cancellations, really. So, did you have a chance to read the paper? Yeah. Yeah, OK. And I think if you can get finance colleagues to look every day what the financial impact is, to look at the activity on a daily basis. We're cancelling a small number of cardiology diagnostics as well. Routine. It's huge, isn't it? Yeah. Probably talking about half a million a week. Yeah, so, I mean, that could be nearly two million by the end of the month, couldn't it? It's two million. That you don't get? Yeah, that we don't get. We need that money to develop services and resources for our patients. So we're looking now at the new financial year and thinking about how we're going to manage it. The advice from the NHS to cancel all non-urgent elective operations does not apply to paediatric surgery. It's the morning of Keelan's operation. We want to just have a sit down just in here for a few minutes. Someone's going to come and see you in just a second, OK? He's been nervous. The last couple of nights he's been quite tearful. But he's literally been, I just want it done now. I want to start getting back on with my life. It's just him getting his life back. That's, that's what's important to me. The operation will only go ahead if there's a bed available in paediatric intensive care. We're going to paediatric intensive care, which is uh, for our patient, Kaelin, is uh, a necessary requisite for his operation because he's got complex needs and some potential breathing problems. A shortage of these beds has led to Keelan's operation being cancelled before. It is a fact that on any winter's day, there may be only a handful of beds in the country for paediatric critical care. They haven't got a bed. They can't do my son's operation. The last time, it really, really upset him. If I'm honest, I don't know how I'm feeling. It's just a numb feeling. Until he goes down for that operation, then, no, I don't know if he'll have it today. I just need to No. You can't do anything. There's nothing you can do, and it makes you feel helpless. 
because as a mum, as a dad, um, it's your job, it's your job to protect them, to make them better, um, and you can't. We're further along the road to surgery than we've ever been, but that could all change. Good morning, team. Good morning. Good morning. Kate. Okay, no, no, we're here. So, we can take your patient this is afternoon. Is it all right? Um, yeah, that's okay. absolutely okay. fine. Oh, fine. bless you. You're bless welcome. You. Okay, all right, then. Thank you. We'll see you later, Mr. Sure. Phillips. Thank Bye. you very much. Hello, it's Mike here. Yeah, we've got a bed if you'd like to send and I'll be down briefing you shortly. Okay, thanks so much and bye. Good. Let's go. I, I, I still struggle to get my trousers off. I, I, I told you them. Yeah. Craft, you're all right. Okay. Thank you. How you doing? You all right? Hello. Hi, you all right? Yeah. So, we're here. We've got a bed. Good game. Yeah, you finally we've got a bed. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry about last night. <laughs> Why are you crying? <laughs> So, Caleb, he's 12 years old, and he's got a really significant restrictive lung deficit. Keelan's scoliosis means he may suffer significant breathing problems during the surgery. Stop moment, Suzanne. So, his blood volume is just over two litres. So, um, I think once he's lost 500, it's probably worth thinking about. Um, and obviously, any time anybody feels that there's an issue, just speak up and we'll pause and talk. A bit brave, aren't you? Okay. They know uh, what they're walking into, and you know, in, without being melodramatic, I always tell the patients and their families that we're putting them in harm's way in the expectation some good will come of it. But uh, yes, for big curves like this, we are uh, at times, you know, facing some very difficult decisions. The choices of him living and being crushed by his own body to the point of him not being able to breathe, not being able to eat, not being able to move, to will he survive this surgery? Is he strong enough? Can he breathe through it? Can he make it? This could go horribly wrong, horribly wrong. It's pretty daunting. You ready? Uh, yeah, please. That's it. You have to tell us afterwards. Yeah. Oh, it's a secret. Oh. I'm not sharing, all right? So, the thing to think of now is just think we're going to take very good care of you. Mr. Growett's going to do a good job. The next thing you know, it'll all be done. Okay, big deep breath for me. We're going to take care of It tastes fabulous, wasn't it? Thank you very much for your help. Take good care of him. You know it's a long day, don't you? Our primary aim is to attach screws which uh, gives us purchase to the spine, which allows us then to transmit some corrective forces to the spine via rods to straighten it. Keelan is placed in traction and weights are used to pull his spine into position. Metal rods will be attached to the vertebrae to hold the straightened spine in place. Any damage to the spinal cord during the operation could leave Keelan paralysed, so his nervous system must be closely monitored throughout. She's just testing that everything's working. You see the feet moving. So she's stimulating the nerves to make sure that everything's working. It's going to be probably in excess of about five hours just to... And that's assuming we don't get a problem. So one of the biggest problems we're going to have, we may lose the spinal cord with responses, electrical responses, and therefore we may have to halt surgery or even abandon the surgery. I don't want to be here. I'm fucking fed up. I understand, darling. This is my daughter. No. With my daughter. 
They'll be here a little bit later, darling. Mavis is one of more than 200 patients across the trust, stuck in hospital, even though doctors have said they are well enough to leave. I, I just worry that she's become quite institutionalised now. She depends on us a lot more than... And her, her cognition, I think, is deteriorated. Do you want some of this milkshake? I don't like it. Mavis suffers from dementia. She cannot be discharged until there is a suitable bed at a local care home. Keeping her in hospital is costing the trust £380 a day. Somebody came to assess one of my patients. She has now been assessed by two different care homes, Beechdale and Park House. She's waiting to hear whether either will accept her. So, just repeat, you can't take her. No room on your dementia unit. OK. All right, thank you. Yes, Bye. Yes. So, unfortunately, they can't accept her. So, they was looking for hoping to get her on the dementia side of Park House, but there's no beds. And they say they're not going to be able to manage her on the, on the other side. And so, that, obviously, that was the home the family really preferred. The beach there, which did accept her, the family have not seen yet. And so, if the family don't like Beechdale, then we're back to square one. If the family are happy for Mavis to go to Beechdale, she could leave hospital today. Hello, is that Sue? Hey, it's Mark from the hospital. Beechdale have accepted her. So, are you happy for her to go there? You've not been there yet? OK. She needs to be there by 4 o'clock and they don't accept over the weekend. So that's, that's just going to be like a stumbling block. But obviously, it all depends on you and whether you're happy. All right, so... Thanks. See you later. Bye. Ah, so frustrating. You're managing families as well as you're managing Mavis, because Mavis's families are quite specialised of where they wanted to go, just because it needs to be on a bus route because they don't drive. But I'm hoping that conversation I had with the daughter will spur them to go and see Beachdale this morning or later on this afternoon. Keelan is halfway through his five-hour operation. Let's just put the screws in and then we'll uh, have a break, OK? There are signs his spinal cord may not be coping well with the surgery. At the moment, the spinal cord monitoring is a bit difficult for us. The uh, nerve's not working well and we think it's direct pressure on the nerve from where he's positioned. So we're going to take the traction off because that may be part of the problem. With the traction removed, Keelan will be repositioned to see if the responses from his spine improve. If they don't, the operation may have to be abandoned. He used to do judo and dancing. And to see him like he is now, it, it's so, so difficult. Cheer. T.A. and... Yeah, 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 you can see they're all really, really good. It's, it's sort of, I, I do Discord. think it's positional and I do think it'll be fine. Yeah, OK, well. that's fine. That's yeah. good. All right, let's see, see how it goes. fair share of things to deal with. He was born at 28 weeks and he weighed 600 grams, which is £1.5. He spent 19 weeks and five days in the neonatal unit. Had a 10% chance of survival. He's always been a fighter. Previously, you, you would have observed that the spine bent over that way, right? But now if you trace your line down, it's a lot straighter. Last night, he said, can you take a photo of my back, Mum? Don't show me now, though. He says, I want to wait until it's all done, and I want you to show me what it looked like. That's pretty, pretty, really good. Uh, 
Hello, it's Mr. Griffith here, down in the theatres. Oh, brilliant. Brilliant, yeah. We're, we're in the unit now, thank you. Brilliant. Thanks, bye-bye. <coughs> we can go see my boy. Bear. <laughs> He's gonna he's, give me some grey hairs, this one, I tell you. Even though Mavis has been accepted into a care home, she remains in hospital. I want to come back to bed. Mavis hasn't had a very good night last night. She was quite unsettled, um, throwing a lot of her, uh, her water jugs, her cups. This has culminated in her being quite tired this morning. She's not in a very good mood today. I want to go back to bed. Let's try and stay up for half an hour no, until can't. tea time. Have I can't dinner? stay up any longer. Why? Because I've had enough. You look at her and she's lost sometimes, isn't yeah. she? She turns on us a lot, don't she? Yeah. Because... But you, you, she'll be nasty with you and then she'll put her hand out and say, I'm sorry. That's our mum and dad. That would be, I think, 1948, 49. And three consecutive years, she won the Glamorous Grandma competition. We've had the best of our mum, but she's still with it. Mavis's daughters have now seen the care home and are happy for her to go there. They, they were good, weren't they, when yeah. we went? It's quite nice inside, she says. But the care home requires a weekly top up fee. Family are more than happy for Mavis to go to Beechdale because they understand the importance of her getting the care there. The issue is surrounding the top up fee. Um, the family unfortunately aren't in a position to be able to financially afford that at the moment. I can imagine that causes a lot of anguish and stress. So, what it's now um, sort of standing on to is Beechdale wavering the top up fee. I can't stop it in any longer, really. I know. We're sorting it out, aren't we? I don't know. Mm. Told you. Across the Trust, the number of medically fit patients like Mavis stuck in hospital is increasing. Today, we've got 227 medically fit. I've done a walk around today on some of our wards, and I'm just astonished how many people are over 95. Five or 10 years ago, you would never have seen that. It's costing more than £100,000 a day to keep these patients in hospital beds they no longer need. Many of these patients are needing additional care when either they go home or to some other facility. We've got to start emptying the hospital so we've got the capacity to get the new groups of patients which are going to be coming through the doors. The pressure is still on. There is still huge demand. We've seen that by the increase in flu numbers across the board. Obviously, with the mandate to cancel elective surgery and the use of these beds. The other issue is around the number of supported discharges. They have increased. So I think we're still in for a challenging um, couple of weeks. Colleagues are um, tired. Um, and, of course, they're expressing frustration because <clears throat> they will be called upon to deal with the outcome of having cancelled their own clinics, which wasn't their choice, and they're not seeing any improvement in performance. Unless the backdoor flow improves, all of this activity is perceived as, as not as futile, but as not really producing anything tangible, um, and that's a frustration. Across the hospital, dozens of operations are still being cancelled. Despite the extra capacity this has created, A&E is once again struggling to cope with the number of patients. 
and the hospital is back on black alert. Joe and Ed, what's ED like? It's pretty tough. It's pretty full. Patients in the middle, 13 hour. The electives have gone down. We've got to use the capacity. In our reality, we should have no one waiting in ED. We've cancelled all the electives. It's widened the pool of beds. So you actually thought, you know, this is going to crack it. It's going to crack the bed occupancy. But we've admitted more patients, and we haven't kept pace with the discharges. And then you're back where you started. Back where we started again, yeah. It's relentless. It's just really sad. It just breaks my heart. I think it's really got to me today. It's been just such a long, difficult winter. It is, has probably been in my whole career, and I've been doing this for a long time now, the hardest I've ever led or managed. What the public want from a health service, I don't think it matches um, what we can provide realistically now. And that's because probably today I'm having a down day about it. Other days I say, don't be so ridiculous. It's cracking. What is? Why? 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 Why is it so bad? Why is it driving you mad? Mavis has been waiting for two days to find out whether Beechdale Care Home will waive their weekly top-up fee. She does deserve to go somewhere that she can get the care that she needs. And certainly hospital, as much as we give her the care and, and she, she likes it here and we like having her, this is not the, the right place for, for Mavis. It's sad because with the ageing population, this, we see more and more of people like Mavis. So it's concerning that there's potentially not enough places out there in the community that are able to deal with them um, and look after them safely. We're just waiting on a bit of paperwork to go through. Amazing. So could that be today? It might be, but we'll... Yes. I just, I'm just... She's still on the phone, so I'll just check Lovely. for now. OK, so I'll try and get doctors to get TTO. She needs to be there by four, don't you? So that's, like, a really good bit of news. So basically the care home has said they're happy to waive, waive the fee. So hopefully, uh, Mavis could go home today, which will be absolutely amazing after being here for so long. We're, we're so close now, so close, fingers crossed, nothing, nothing's going to get in the way. And hopefully Mavis, she'll be in a, a more serene environment, will be better for her, and she'll be out of an acute bed. Mavis. Hello. It's Mark. <laughs> How are you? Oh. I might have got some good news for you. Oh. You better leave us. Oh, God. Good. All right. Can you hear us? Thank you, Mark. No worries. Yeah. Yeah. We've uh, booked the transport. Tablets are already here. So, all steam ahead. We're we'll get Mavis home today, finally. I'll, I'll come and say bye when the ambulance people get here. All right. All yeah. right. Thank you. See you in a bit. What have I done with them? Ah! I had a med. What have I done with the med? Oh, no. I'm looking for maybe his medications. I've just been to check them to make sure they was all present and I've misplaced them somewhere. I can't find them. OK, so now I'm feeling physically sick. Oh, shit. I don't want this to be my fault if she doesn't manage to make it out. So I just need to figure out what I've done with them. I literally had them in my hand, Karen. She needs to be home by four. And if it means we're going to have to get the, them redone by pharmacy, that's going to delay everything by quite a substantial amount of time. I didn't leave any medications in here, did I? I don't think so, no. Oh, no. Oh, I really are. Yeah. Yeah. Hello, Mavis. There you go, that's all your tablets to go home. Oh. Berlin and Suno, you go in. Yeah. And they're going to meet you there. All right. All yeah. right. Thank you. See you in a bit. Hello, would it be possible to speak to Richard? The cut off point for Mavis to get to the care home is 4 pm. Hi, Richard, it's Mark on B48. With no sign of transport, she may have to spend another night in hospital. I'm doing my very best to get Mavis to you this afternoon. Um, I'm having an issue with transport, but I was just trying to ascertain, is there any way that we could 
extend the cutoff to that five. Lovely, thank you. Bye. So I've just spoke to Richard, who's the manager of Beachdale, and he's happy to extend the cutoff time from 4 pm to 5 pm, which is give us a little bit more leeway to hopefully get home. So fingers crossed. After this, I don't know what else I can do. I think we've covered all avenues and we have done our best for Mavis to try and get her home today. Are you here for Mavis Gibbs? Oh my god. Lovely. <laughs> Told you. Yes, they come. Just turn around. That's it, lovely. You did well there. Take care, all right? God bless you. God bless you. See you later. Look after yourself. Mwah. All right. You take care. Thank you. God bless you. See you later, Mavis. Oh, well, then. Yes. God, I'm so happy. How you doing, Mark? Oh, my God, I'm over the moon. I didn't think that was going to happen. Did not think that was going to go. I'm so happy. Six weeks after doctors said she was well enough to leave hospital, Mavis is finally on her way to a care home. I just think it's better for Mavis. In her own environment, and she can settle down, and she'll have her own room, she'll have her own things. And she'll be out of an acute bed. Yes. You're a bit of all right, you are. <laughs> Morning. You look a bit brighter. Yeah, he's had a wash. Yeah? Yeah. All right. Do you fancy maybe trying to go for a little bit of a walk? Yeah? If you, if, we'll see how far we go. We're not, I'm not on about taking you, like, to the shops, just up and, up and down a little bit, all right? Should we move your phone out of the way? Keelan is being assessed by a physiotherapist following his operation. All right. Do you want to have a roll onto your side, then? To see how much you can do? Right, on three, so you dig your elbow in. One, two, three, so shuffle that bum. How well he responds will be a sign of how successful the surgery has been. Feel a bit wobbly, yeah. I can barely see anything. Yeah, so just have a sit there for a minute. Is that because of your dizziness? Do you want to try and have a stand up? Yeah? Come on then. Right, those feet flat on the floor. Up you come. Right. Good boy. Okay. Well done, mate. Well done. Good lad. How's that dizziness? A bit better? Try have a turn round? Yeah? Good lad. Just keep stepping those feet. Good lad. There you go. Good lad. All right. Did really well, mate. All right. I'll pop back later on. All right. See you later. Brilliant to see that. You just can't imagine it. You can't imagine getting to this point. Um, you know, seeing him the way you were and how he was becoming really twisted to now, it's... There's no words for it. No words. <laughs> Good evening, good Hi, evening, all right, good day, Keelan. You want to go home, I gather, is that right? If yeah? you can, yeah. Yeah? Yeah. How do you feel? Yeah, it's still hurting, but... Mm -hmm. all right, is, is it manageable with all the tablets you take? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, good, good, good. How much taller are you? He's five foot one. So I think we've, we've got a gain of about probably two and a half inch. Yeah, yeah, good. Anything else I can help you with? Question. Yeah, I was gonna ask, um, you know, in the future. In the future? Yeah. Will I have scoliosis then or not? I think one can safely say no. Okay. This is it. I've been done with. That's it. Done and dusted. Been a long journey, but I think we're at the end now. Obviously, he's a 12 year old boy that was quite disfigured, really, through the scoliosis. And I think. 
in his own mind and his fear, he probably thought he was going to be like that for life. I know he's delighted with how he looks now. Let's go. Just so proud of him. Some people go through the whole life without meeting their hero. I gave birth to mine. Thank you.